Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. And uh, we have a former Anglican with us tonight. I guess probably, if you look at over the years, probably the largest percentage of our guests were former Anglicans. It kind of makes sense because uh, of the nearness. On the one hand, because of the nearness of Anglicanism to the Catholic Church, but as you'll hear from the story, that nearness can be deceptive. Mm -hmm. Sadly, and so we pray for our Anglican and Episcopalian brothers and sisters. Our guest tonight is Emily Woodham. Emily, welcome to the Journey Home. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Oh, thank uh, you. Came all the way out from the west side of the United States, right? Yes, sir. Boise, Idaho. <laughs> well, it's good to have you here. <laughs> thank you. Uh, let me take a step back and invite you to start us on the journey. Well, let's see. My um, my dad was raised Catholic, and he left the church when he was in college. Okay. And uh, my mother was Episcopalian, so they married in the Episcopal Church. But my godparents are Catholic. My mother said that they were the most Christian people she knew. They lived the most Christian lives. <laughs> so she chose her good friends to be uh, my godparents. You know, they didn't proselytize, and my grandparents yeah. really didn't proselytize either. But they were there. And so I just kind of had this love of the church from the time I was little. And um, even though I was told, so my dad, he was careful to tell me that Catholics didn't worship the saints. They didn't worship Mary. They prayed to them. And he explained from Hebrews, the great cloud of witnesses. But he said it was unnecessary and that it interfered with the grace of God to do that. It was just, it was an extra step instead of really having that personal relationship with Jesus. And Which is interesting there. So on the one hand, your father... Um, explained away and discounted the usually uh, perceived uh, misunderstandings exactly. of the church, but then added a few extras. He did. You know what I'm saying? In yes, other words, sir. Yeah. He did. Okay. He did. And so he was trying to walk, walk this balance, right? Because yeah. he didn't, he didn't have that experience of that personal relationship with Jesus growing up, and and he had actually gone to minor seminary. He went for two years and decided not to be a priest, and then he went to Holy Cross High School in San Antonio, and um, and he still left the church when he was in college. Yeah. And so, um, but I was given his childhood books, and I would pour over these books on the saints and the mass, and I just loved it yeah. until, and uh, my mom said, you know, I told my mom I want to be a nun, and she said, <laughs> you can't be a nun. We're not Catholic. And I said, no, I really want, I want to be a nun. And so they, the books disappeared after that. <laughs> but um, so they were trying to walk this fine line. They didn't, I mean, my godparents were Catholic and I had grand, Catholic grandparents. And her dad had been Catholic and he also had left the church. Um, and her mother was Episcopalian. So there was this, I had a lot of Catholic families. They were trying to walk that fine line. Yeah. They didn't want to create animosity but they really didn't want me in the church. They really felt like the Catholic Church added burdens of you know, salvation by works and um, that it was too legalistic. Yeah. But yet they, they kind of set you up though. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm surprised that the Episcopalians would allow Catholics to be the grandparents. I mean, the godparents, excuse me. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. I'm surprised they would allow that to happen. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. No, the, um, I, I think a lot of Episcopalians, a lot of people yeah. in the Anglican communion see Catholics world as friendly, in a friendly way. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So, yeah. Yeah, so, there you have your, I mean, the Catholicism is right there in your life, but both parents trying to... Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> and then walk around. And even telling you some things that would be in your uh, subconscious against the church. Right, right. Okay. yeah, because that was just a continuous yeah. fear. So yeah. I was in grade school, I was sixth grade, and I remember the um, teacher saying stuff about the Catholic Church, and I corrected her. I was like, that's not what the Catholic Church teaches, and, <laughs> and uh, so I'm defending the Pope and the Catholic <laughs> Church in school and in youth group, while at the same time going, oh no, but I could never be Catholic, you know, that would just, that would take away my relationship with Jesus. So it was this weird kind of dance. And my husband um, was also raised Episcopalian, but he didn't have um, that. He, his family had been Protestant since the Reformation. You know, they had been Methodists or Baptists, a lot of country preachers. And um, his family became Episcopalian as his parents did. And um, 
And so he was raised in the church and then he left in college. He's nine years older than me. And he um, joined the Baptist Student Union and decided to be Baptist. And um, we met in a non-denominational church and discovered we both had that in common, um, being in the Episcopal, coming from the Episcopal Church. And because my family had left when I was 12, sorry. So he yeah. left when he was in college and my family had left when I was 12 because of um, the general convention in Anaheim in like 1984 okay. with the bishops was just... When they left, did they just drop church or did they go somewhere else? Oh no, they went um, non-denominational, okay, charismatic. Okay. Oh yeah, okay. yeah. You had mentioned something though that I wanna go back just a little bit. You had made this comment when you were defending the Catholic Church um, in school, elementary right. school. But you also said you weren't going to go there because it would it would step in the way of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have a relationship with Jesus Christ as a young girl? I did. I did. How did that happen? I, how did that happen? I don't you know. My <laughs> Baptist <laughs> friends are go so frustrated with me because I can't remember. I don't have that definitive moment right. of when I was saved. I just believed. Yeah. My mother had this beautiful faith, and um, she always took me with her to church. We went every Sunday and she was so involved with the church. She was on the altar guild and she made sure that um, if we didn't have school and there was a funeral, we went to that funeral because um, that was a member, the parish was your family. And so like funerals and weddings and we were involved with all kinds of things in our parish. And I just believed. And um, okay. when she was in the sacristy, I used to sneak into the um, sanctuary and look for angels when I was little. And I would sit on the altar steps. I would sneak up on the altar steps because I knew it was holy and I had to be very respectful. And I would ask God to hold me. I said, you know, Lord, please hold me on your lap. And I mean, I was little, but I had that childlike faith, you know, because I, I remember what it was like to just believe. I remember when adults would um, talk about how confusing the Trinity is. You know, the Trinity is a mystery and you really don't understand it. And being a kid going, why are they saying this? It's so simple, three and one. I don't understand why the adults are so confused. And it wasn't until I was older and then I went, oh yes, it's much deeper in, than that. But to have that childlike faith where Jesus is my friend. And I even believed I had a guardian angel, which frustrated my mom. She's like, I don't know where you got that from <laughs> because it's so Catholic. But I, I named my guardian angel and I would ask her to, to help me in my day. And I, I never knew the guardian angel prayer. I didn't know any of that. I just believed. <laughs> I mean, what that's a great gift then. I mean, that you had come to know Christ early and as a witness to your mother. I mean, that's a real blessing. So there, it, it there was, you have, very so grateful. that wasn't a question. You were, you had that. And even though you were saying that you have this relationship with Christ and, uh, and you don't want to lose that. So no. there was the reason that, oh no, I'm not thinking the Catholic church, I'll defend it, but I'm not going there. No. So you meet your husband in college. Yeah. By this time, your family had become non-denominational charismatic mm -hmm. and he had become Baptist. Right, right. So and, then, then, and then he went into the charismatic church too, because okay. the Baptist, it was, um, he just wanted um, a more free relationship with Jesus, something uh, that's full of the spirit. And um, so he, he be, so we met in the non-denominational church. And just my parents are going back to a little Episcopal church in Oklahoma City. <laughs> and so um, my husband and I actually broke up. We were dating and we broke up. And then I started going to this little Episcopal church and I loved it. Mm -hmm. The rector there was very kind and um, loved Jesus so much. He had a great, um, I don't know, he was just a wonderful pastor. Were you drawn back a little bit because of the liturgies? Yes, I did. and I had always missed the church. When my family left, I was 12, you know, and I cried. And I told <laughs> my mom, I don't want to leave the Episcopal Church, and I want to get married in the Episcopal Church, and I want to baptize my babies in the Episcopal Church. And she said, if you want it that, then you have to pray for a miracle. Because the only way we're ever going back to the Episcopal Church is if there's a miracle. So, <laughs> there you go. so, so. I went back and... Um, and I became confirmed because when we, we left right before I started confirmation classes, so I became confirmed. And so my husband came back to the Episcopal Church. We started dating again and we were married in the Episcopal Church and we baptized our first um, born in the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. And then when we had, uh, we, we were married in Oklahoma City, we moved to Dallas. And, um, and then when we moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, we left the church. It was just... Um, it was really hard to find a church, um, an Episcopal church, where we felt like we could really raise our children in um, the in the Word of God and in mm -hmm. um, 
where, where there was a sense of objective truth. And mm. so we felt like the, um, the Episcopal Church was becoming really more and more universalist and less and less Catholic in its view. And so we wanted, so we, we went back to the non-denominational churches, but I started homeschooling. And um, Before we go there, okay, yes, our sir. guest is Emily Woodham. Because it, would you say that if we pause for a second, yes, you, you're Episcopalian and then uh, non-denominational, a little bit of charismatic, a little bit of Baptist, back to the Episcopalian, and then you don't find one, so you go. It would seem to me that you both, you and your husband, were of the mindset that uh, it doesn't so much matter what church you belong to. Oh, that's a great point. As long as it's the faith in Jesus Christ. That's really, mm. you know, it's not church. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's f focusing on Christ and making sure that your local church, that's, that's why I would go there or not go there. Right, right. It is, um, I, because we did see the universal church as being something as more spiritual. Yeah. The invisible. You know, invisible, yeah. right. Yeah. So the, the Catholic church was a part of that, and we didn't feel like the Catholic church was for us. And all these other denominations are a part of this universal Catholic church, right? Yeah. But, um, so it really, we had the responsibility, though, to worship where the Lord led us to worship. Okay. And to raise our children where the Lord led us to raise our children. All right. Yeah. So let me think. So you're not Episcopal. Did you? So what did you find? Did you find a? You said you were getting into homeschooling here, which we're going to talk about. But yeah. had you found another church yet? Before? We did. We did. We found a, a non-denominational okay. church. Okay. But there you go. Yeah, you said that before. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to non-denominational, which is yeah. kind of the. Uh, that's what everything's becoming nowadays. It's mm -hmm. seen by they're <laughs> everywhere you turn. They are. But homeschooling had something to do with it. We did. It did. So the family that owned our house before in Raleigh, they were Catholic homeschoolers, and they had five kids. And so I would get their um, their mailings, you know, their catalogs, <laughs> you know, for current resident. And um, we started talking about it more. We couldn't afford private school, so we decided instead of public school that we would homeschool. And I, I didn't want to use the Catholic curriculum, but I did find there was one that was Reformed Presbyterian, and it was classical. And I, I liked that it included some liturgy because I really mm. missed that for my kids. It wasn't in the church where we were going. And um, so I decided we decided to use that curriculum. And as we were using it, it used a lot of the church fathers. And it got me more interested into reading the church fathers. And then after a while, I got tired of just reading about what they were saying the church fathers were saying. I wanted to read the, the actual translations of the actual texts. And... Um, and so then it began, like, what are we doing in the non-denominational church? And we were not far from... I mean, was your husband also exploring them? He too, was a little bit, yeah. He was, he always like, oh, you've always loved the Catholics. I mean, I like the Catholics, but I mean, you've always <laughs> loved the Catholics, Emily. You know, and um, so I asked him if I could take the kids to an Ash Wednesday um, service at a Catholic church nearby, at St. Francis of Assisi Monastery in Raleigh. And he was like... All right, sure. You know, if you want to do that, and um, and we went to good. I took the kids to Good Friday, and and then we went to Midnight Mass. And the brothers there were so kind and sweet, and the priest too. He was like, "If the kids cry, don't worry about it. You know, just stay." <laughs> but we're, so we're coming so close. Then we talk about becoming Catholic, and we're like, "No, no, no. We're not going to do that. You know, no, no. We're going to lose that again. That personal relationship with Jesus." Hmm. Yeah. Would you say that was? I mean, what were the biggest barriers that were standing in the way of you making that last jump? I think it's fear. I think really the sacrament of confession was probably my biggest hmm. because to me that seemed um, to really interfere with faith and grace. I mean, if I'm forgiven, why do I need to go to a priest for absolution? And um, so, I mean, I, I didn't, and I, be, I did get more, my brother was going to Moody Bible Institute. He graduated. Okay. I can't remember when, but when I was a mother. So he would send me things, you know, from Spurgeon or um, R.C. Sproul, R.C. Sproul Jr. Yeah. And I would um, read those. And I just, so I really struggled with the, I, I believed the sacrament of baptism, confirmation, and um, the Eucharist were all important. Yeah. And um, consubstantiation, even transubstantiation, I mean, I, I grew up in, churches where they reserved the sacrament and that was Jesus 
Yeah. It, they would say, well, we're not transubstantiation, we're consubstantiation. But to me, as a child growing up, Jesus is in this sacrament, yeah. right? And, um, so, but it was that, that confession was like, that just seemed yeah. to interfere with my being able just to go to God, right? Which, I found that sometimes when people have a problem with confession or they talk about it, that we don't, and I did too, we, we don't realize that we had a different idea of sin. Mm. Right? I mean, that's the different reason. Yeah. Like you said, if I'm forgiven, then why do I need this other stuff? Right. Well, it's because we had a different view of sin. Yes. You know, the, the idea that, well, sin has this temporal stuff that we got to deal with. We can be forgiven, but we still got to pay for the broken window. That, use that right. analogy. Right. That's excellent. But yes. from where you were coming from, that wasn't a part of your thinking. So, what, no. so like even purgatory probably didn't make sense either. It didn't. <laughs> it didn't. And I had read um, The Great Divorce when I was yep. in high school. I had read C.S. Lewis. C. Yeah. But, you know, to me, I was, it was like, well, it's not, but purgatory, it was just a way to explain things. It wasn't um, you know, my English teacher is like, it's just a way to explain things. He didn't really believe in purgatory. Well, you're it. Actually, he did. <laughs> and um, skipping ahead, I had made um, friends with uh, um, somebody who had, my friend Annie, who had her PhD in uh, religion from Emory. Yep. And she had specialized in second and third Christi century Christianity. And she had told me, Emily, the Christians have always believed that there was a journey after death, that there's some sort of purgation. And now she was Anglican and she said, well, the Catholics, you know, this, you know, idea of an actual purgatory, that's more Catholic, but the idea of a journey after death to um, be added to, yeah. into heaven was, has always been there in the ancient Christianity. I was like, and that changes things. Yeah. It's just my view, yeah. Was your husband, you know, was he interested with you on this as you were drawing a little bit you know i mean even we went on our honeymoon we went to venice and we did we actually talked about the catholic church even on our honeymoon because we went to um <laughs> saint mark basilica and it was really hard not to be able to receive communion so we're walking the streets of venice and talking about the catholic church he's an engineer he's much more rational than i am <laughs> and um he so he he approached everything very logically um and so he, he just really wants to just worship the Lord. And um, to him, he has more of a, he's more suspicious of theologians than I am. I'm very curious. And um, he, he really is, he knows his scripture really well. And um, I don't know, he just, so he was kind of on the fence. And um, so after we, we moved from Raleigh to Austin, and we're still homeschooling, and we went through, um, a period of time where it's just one trial after another. Mm -hmm. And um, my, <laughs> he had switched jobs. We were really sick in Austin. The allergies were really bad and we were actually looking at moving and um, trying to move to Seattle. He switched jobs and then I had to have triple hernia repair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and we had four kids. The youngest was just a toddler. And then my mother died suddenly. And mm -hmm. he was close to my mom. He really loved her. So it was very hard for him too. Um, her heart valve collapsed, and that was in November oh. of 2008. And um, he, I, uh, and, then, and then our son, our youngest son, had to be hospitalized for bacterial pneumonia. We almost lost mm. him. Oh. So we just went through this darkness, a spiritual mm. darkness. And um, I re was very drawn to the Catholic Church after that. But it was a... I don't know, I'm a very intuitive person. It was just, it felt like the Holy Spirit was just drawing me mm -hmm. to the Catholic Church. But my husband, it was a little different because he, I was looking at theology and reading so many books trying to figure out, it was after all that we had gone through, I was like, Lord, I don't know who you are anymore. I thought I knew you. I've known you my whole life. I can't think of a time when I haven't known you. Mm -hmm. But after all this, Lord, I don't know who you are anymore. Who are you? and show me who you are, show me your face. I don't know who you are anymore because you don't fit in anything that I've, I've known in my head. I, yeah. You don't fit there anymore. And um, my husband went to Tolkien, and he had been reading <laughs> The Lord of the Rings since he was 13 years old, and he had read it and reread it. And after all that, he went back to Lord of the Rings and Tolkien. Yeah. And um, in 2009, he took a sabbatical, 
um, just to kind of get everyone. He decided to work on a book, and it, but it gave him this time with the family. And um, he started reading Lord of the Rings every night to our kids. And you would think that a bunch of kids would, you know, they wouldn't sit and listen, but they did. <laughs> and um, he started with The Hobbit, actually, and then he went into Lord of the Rings. And it took about two years. <laughs> but those kids, <laughs> they loved it. They ate it up. And, um, and so at night we would talk about it. And even though Tolkien was like, it is not an analogy, <laughs> or it's, you know, it's not an allegory. Um, they, it's just so full of faith, and it's yeah. full of the Catholic faith. And so we started talking more about the Catholic Church as Tolkien's church and Tolkien's faith. And um, that, that's how he became drawn mm. to the Catholic Church, because of what um, the Catholic faith did for Tolkien and all that he survived and all that he went through and how that came out in his writing. Mm. Yeah, the... That often happens uh, when, I remember when I worked with, uh, in a youth ministry, non-denominational youth ministry, and we, we never want to pull people where we, as the leaders, went to church. It was non-denominational. But often, when the kids would have a reawakening of faith, they'd go where the leaders are. Hmm. The same thing happens with authors. You find a great author yeah. you love and you want to read him, but then pretty soon I want to know about, more about that author. And then you find out his convictions, and pretty soon there you are. And sometimes yeah. it's a good thing, and sometimes it's not a good thing. Yeah. C.S. Lewis was one of those that got real oh, yes. close to the Catholic Church. In the end, it was tough for him, but he was about as Catholic as you can get without coming in. It's so true. And yeah. I think that's part of what kept me back. Like, well, there's so much work to becoming Catholic. And that magisterium, I'm not entirely sure about that magisterium. And look at C.S. Lewis, my hero. He never became Catholic, and surely nobody could say that, you know, he's not in heaven, right? <laughs> and it did, it, it kept me back. And um, we eventually, um, we decided to go back to the Episcopal Church after all that we had gone through. We had found a wonderful Episcopal Church in Austin, and that's where I met my friend Annie, who was teaching at um, St. Edward's University. She was an adjunct professor, um, although she was um, Anglican. And um, she, she was so encouraging to me and um, talking to me about faith. She was an answer to prayer, really. And she, um, our, we couldn't stay in our non-denominational homeschool group anymore because they wanted me to sign a statement of faith yeah. that we believe in the six, literal six-day creationism. And I'm like, I can't sign this. <laughs> And, and this statement of faith is something I said, and I said, C.S. Lewis couldn't even sign this, which really made people upset, but it's true. He couldn't even yeah. sign it. And so um, I went to my little Bible study with, with Annie at this Episcopal church, and I said, I wonder, because it wasn't long after the ordinariate was um, started by Pope um, Benedict, and I said, I wonder if the Catholic homeschoolers would let us in their group. And Annie perked up, and she said, that. It's a great idea. Yes, you need to do that. You need to go to the Catholic homeschoolers. You need to do that. So um, I emailed them and they let us in and it was wonderful. We loved it. And um, I think we're going to pause oh, there. Sure. Let's take our little usual break here because we've got you. Uh, your Anglican friend has encouraged you to go to a Catholic homeschooling. <laughs> uh, and it's interesting because you had said that. Um, even St. C.S. Lewis wouldn't sign that that uh, agreement, that statement of faith. Yeah. Uh, but I would almost waiting for you to turn to your Anglican and say, but do you sign the statement of faith of your church with all the things that it's gotten into your friend who stays an Anglican, but yeah. yet the Anglican church has sadly moved into some other areas. We'll That's come true. back to that after That's the so break. True. Our guest is Emily Woodham, as I mentioned, and I want to tell you that just... If you go to chnetwork.org, that's the website for the Coming Home Network, Emily's story is up there and it's posted. Uh, it's called From High Church to the True Church. So if you go to chnetwork.org, you'll be able to get her full story as well as many other conversion stories that we always are printing in our newsletter and now have posted on our website. So we'd love to have you visit chnetwork.org. All right, be back in just a moment.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Emily Woodham. Uh, as I mentioned, your story on that was in the newsletter from high church to the true church it was an overall description, but you weren't always high church. You were kind of oh, you yeah, were kind of exploring that. But <laughs> you were as you were saying though, the 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 liturgies and you were missing that. That was yeah. always kind of something drawing yeah. you back. And now now as we as we paused before the break, you had said that uh, your Anglican friend had indeed encouraged you to go to that Catholic homeschool. That's right. And and we did. It was wonderful because there was this um it was okay to, you know, natural reason, natural law was a thing, yeah. and um, the Catholics seemed to embrace more of their the you know the spiritual, the mental, and the physical in their approach to um, to religion, to truth, and it just felt more firm. You know, it just yeah. felt really good, and also there was this the mother seemed more real. And, and not that I have, I have wonderful Protestant friends that I love and they're very real, but just overall in this Protestantism, at least in this part that we were in, there was a lot of pressure. You, know, you have to bear the fruit of the spirit. And they say it's not works, but it's almost like you're, you yeah. gotta fake it till you make it. You know, bear this fruit <laughs> of the spirit. And we were in a place of brokenness. We just come through so much. And the Catholics had this view that it's a faith journey and it's okay if you have this darkness or this these dry spells. It's okay to be broken, and God still loves you, and He's still there, in a way that um, and I, so I, I experienced the mercy of God in a way that I did not feel like I was experiencing in my Protestant churches. And um, I'm trying to be very careful because again, mm -hmm. I have those Protestant friends that mean so much to me. But there was a mercy there of being real and being where I was. And, um, you know, and I the, the, thing, that. the thing you just described about about um, the journey and the struggles that you've been through and seeing those as a part of the journey uh, yeah. reminds me that Protestants, one of the most, the second most common read book amongst non-Catholic Christians besides the scriptures is a book called The Imitation of Christ. Which yes. is clearly about just what you talked about. I mean, so much. And the reason I bring this up is I can't remember how I juxtaposed what you're talking about. Yet here's what my favorite book as a Protestant said, that you're going to have suffering. That's a part of the journey. And that's right. That's right. And it, it does. It just feels like it's put, you know, the Protestants love to talk about justification and sanctification and, and that debate of, you know, yep. are you instantly sanctified because of your justification and all of that. And it's, but it, what it comes across is, well, I have to, I'm, I'm not saved by my works and I, and, and my works don't seem to count for anything, but I need to bear that fruit. And it's just, it's really <laughs> this, it's kind yep. of dual minded because that fruit that you're supposed to bear becomes a performance almost like, oh, I can't. Mm -hmm. I, I need to. I need to have. Um, I can't express my brokenness. I can't express my mourning. And I know I'm, I'm talking in some extremes. It's not like right, you know Protestants right. don't mourn, but it's almost like this uh, forced faith because it's by faith alone and grace alone you just bear this. You must bear this fruit to to truly be huh. Christian, which is just completely cockeyed. Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. It's, and I think I, it's at the time I I thought it made sense, but you know <laughs> I'm like. And what was I thinking? I don't know if this if this sounds true to you, Emily, from your experience, but it seems to me that, and I've said this before in the journey home, that it seems that in general, one of the big differences between so many of the Protestant ways of understanding theology and the Catholic way is the Protestants insist on this black and white either or, mm. either or, faith or reason, faith yes, or reason. I see you know, that. so mm -hmm. whereas the Catholics, it's a both and. It's the yes. mystery of the both and. Yes. And, and that yeah. gets with suffering. It's a both and, you know, yes. faith and reason. And what's interesting as you were talking about homeschooling is if you're, if you're caught in this dichotomy mm -hmm. of having to say faith or reason, mm -hmm. then that's going to show up in homeschooling with natural theology and different right. things. You can't go there because that's reason. Whereas Catholic, right. it's a both and. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It was so, it was so freeing. And um, 
You know, I had some experiences when my son was in the hospital and then afterwards, like I said, I felt like the Holy Spirit was drawing me to the Catholic Church and to have these women to kind of, I, I didn't want to pretend I didn't know and I didn't want to, felt like I was ready to become Catholic, but just to be able to talk with them, um, such a blessing and it was so good and my kids loved it. But then um, my husband found a job in Boise, Idaho, and we had to transfer, and we come to Boise, and we arrived in 2012, and we were like, my husband and I had some deep conversations, and we were like, we're not becoming Catholic. So we are not joining the Catholic homeschool group. We're not, we're done with this. <laughs> we're going to, um, we, we showed up in Boise, and um, the Episcopal Church had Planned Parenthood with their youth group, and we're like, we're not doing the Episcopal Church. <laughs> That's off the table. We were very pro-life, and we couldn't believe it that the they had Planned Parenthood doing a retreat with their youth. Like. And uh, so we're like, no, that's that's wrong and that's, that's evil. Bizarre. Don't yeah. Think about so it, no. we're we're done with the Episcopal Church. So we found um, an Anglican church. So we're going to go to the Anglican Church, and and um, we're done with the we're done with the Catholic Church. So I joined the non-denominational group again. Well, in the non-denominational group, um, they had this email about a PE group, and I was like, my kids were brand new in Boise. We need something to do. We need to make friends. So I joined the PE group where I sent an email. And the, the leader, Gina Schmidt, emailed back and she said, I noticed you have four children and their names. Um, would you be interested in the Mormon group? Or we also have a Catholic group that maybe you'd be interested in. And I wrote back and I said, well, actually we're Anglican. I was in the, the Catholic group in Austin, but we're Anglican and I'm fine just in the non-denominational group or whatever I said. And the next email she had copied me on the leader of the Catholic homeschool group in Boise, and they're like, oh, we went ahead and added you in. And so I'm in the cat. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to explain this to David. I mean, that's exactly how it went. You got too many kids. That's the problem. <laughs> oh, so, so I'm in the Catholic group again. And um, I laughed. I just laughed because I don't know how I'm going to explain this to David. So I told David, and he was like, you know, all right. And because he knew we needed to make friends because yeah. in the Anglican church where we were going, there were like there was one other family with small children, mm. and so and when you homeschool, your social life comes out of your church. So um, so here we are, we're hanging out with Catholics again, and we loved it. My kids joined the teen book club, and <laughs> we were doing um, literary guilds with them, and we absolutely loved it. And they're just so open. And my husband, he was okay with it. And then he read Kreft's book on the philosophy of Tolkien, and he thought, this is really good. So he's getting a little closer, <laughs> a little closer, but, um, and we actually went to our, I became pregnant with our fifth, and uh, we went to an RCIA class a few times that was taught by somebody who's been on your show, De Deacon Lou Aaron, oh. <laughs> who was on here not that long ago, and um, he, um, but all of a sudden it just came to a stop. Like, well, why become Catholic when maybe we could become Orthodox? Maybe we should become Orthodox, you know? And um, and it has nothing against, it wasn't Deacon Lou Aaron's fault at all. It was us. <laughs> but it, 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 we just, it just kind of came to a stop again. And um, we found a different Anglican church that was a little bit bigger and had more families, but it was very low church. But at least it was this happy... Um, heavy medium for us you know we weren't being we're in the catholic church some liturgy and we they had families and so we did that and um but we kept going to mass just visiting mass we'd kept sleeping in and um, especially with a baby and um and then my uh my catholic um homeschooling friends decided to start a co-op and um so anyway i'm trying we, I decided I wanted to start a homeschool dance uh, because uh, my kids miss the dances like in Austin. And um, I asked the Catholic moms, you know, about do, starting one. And they said, sure, go ahead and do a homeschool dance. And I have been reading and um, more and more theology and I'm more and more interested in the Catholic church, but I'm really afraid to talk to a priest because I'm afraid I'm going to not, I'm going to just become Catholic and there's no other 
course of action. And, and so I'm afraid to talk to a priest. I haven't talked to a priest. For all my experience was with the Catholic Church, never talked to a priest. And the Catholic mom said, you can do this dance, but we want a priest involved. Just like when we went to Catholic school, there was a priest. For a homeschool dance, we want a priest there. And I said, okay. And I heard about this Father Ben Ullincott and that he was great with youth. And so I made an appointment to meet with him and um, just to talk about the dance. So we talked about the dance for 10 minutes. And as I was leaving, he said, so where do you go? What parish do you belong to? <laughs> and I said, Holy Trinity Anglican. Or I said, Holy Trinity. Sorry, I said, Holy Trinity. And I tried to leave. And he said, wait a minute. Is that, is that a mission? Is that a new? I haven't heard of that. And he just looked so confused. And I said, it's Anglican. And then he like crossed his arms and he sat down. So why aren't you Catholic? And I said, <laughs> um, and I said, well, <laughs> and, he, and we just had this conversation. And um, it was this beautiful conversation about um, the Reformation and Henry VIII and C.S. Lewis and um, <laughs> just the different different theology. I haven't, hadn't really talked to a friend about theology since we had left Austin mm -hmm. and my conversations with Annie. And so it was so neat to be able to just sit and talk about the Lord and talk about different ideas and to talk about scripture and, and to talk about the church. And um, all of us, and I, my baby, I had my baby with me and, and she fell asleep and, and we're just talking, almost whispering, just talking about the Lord. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly he said, you pray the rosary, don't you? And I said, yes. And suddenly I realized the mistake I made by admitting that I had prayed the rosary. And he <laughs> got up and he ran to his um, bookcase and he grabbed a book on um, sacramental theology. It was just called Guide to the Sacraments um, by Macquarie, who was an Oxford professor. And he said, you need to read this book. And it's a guide to the sacraments. And I thought, after all that we've talked about, he's handing me a guide to the sacraments inside, you know, my pride. Mm -hmm. And I thought, and this little voice said, be teachable, be mm -hmm. teachable. So I took the book from him and um, I was so excited. The re I mean, he blessed my daughter and me and the rest of the day was glorious. And my um, dad was coming in town to visit and I just was, um, just, it was just this glorious day. But I put the book on the shelf, I mentioned to David and he was like, why did he give you a book? Like he's not ready to become Catholic. So I put it up on the shelf and I was afraid to read it and um, kind of left it there. But then this homeschool co-op um, that we were joining, they were meeting at St. Mark's where he was pastor. <laughs> and um, so I, um, I finally read this book. And when I read it, I, my eyes were opened, Con confession, and not just, not just the Eucharist, not just baptism, and not just confirmation, but co confession, the way he described yeah. confession and the need for it, even though he was Anglican, I just was blown away. And if I had not done all that reading after my mother's death, I would never have been able to understand that book. Yeah. Because, I mean, it mentions like uh, Karl Barth and Skilibex and all these other theologians that I would have never known if I had not read all those books. And, and I just devoured it. I loved it. But then I was in this quandary because my husband's still not ready. And my kids, now that we're in this co-op, they started beating the Catholic kids in catechism games. And they're like, why can't we become Catholic? We want to become Catholic. And uh, So did you come in before your husband? I didn't. Okay. I'm praying All a right. lot. All right. And my brother became Catholic. <laughs> oh, that, that's a he left did. field. Uh, he did. My brother... Um, he was interested in the Catholic Church, and he actually said to me, I remember that um, when he was at Moody Bible Institute, um, he was told that about 10% of the graduates become Catholic or Orthodox. Hmm. Because once they get into church history, yeah. they, they, they can't see another way. And so um, my brother and I would talk about the church sometimes. And um, not long after we moved to Boise, I'd had a dream about Mary and I had told my brother about it, and it turns out he had also had a dream about the Catholic Church. Yeah. And so he and his wife became Catholic. And so he was sharing with me and the kids, and even my husband, stuff about the church. All right. Yeah. And um, so we, um, we just 
my husband became close and then he'd go away and he'd come close and go away. And my brother visited and he said, um, he said, Emily, your husband is not God. And he said, God really wants you to be Catholic. And the kids, he said, your husband is not God. And that was mind blowing for me because, and it shouldn't be, but it was because in the evangelical circles that we were in, you know, you submit to your husband yeah. and you su he's your spiritual head and you submit to him. So I hadn't really considered becoming Catholic without him. And he would say that sometimes, well, maybe you should just become Catholic, but it always felt wrong and bad because he's my spiritual head. But he said, your husband is not God. David is not God. And God wants you to be Catholic. And he said, it's so obvious. And, um, and he loves my husband. It was all said in love. So I was like, well, I don't know what to do. So um, we had this, we were, it was, we were writing, it was uh, the week of, um, the week before Valentine's Day, and our co-op wrote these little notes to Father Ben to thank him for letting us meet there. And in mine, I said, thank you so much for that book. We never talked about the book. I had just dropped it off at the church. Thank you so much for that book. And my husband says, because he did, we will discern during Lent whether or not to become Catholic once and for all. Please pray for us. And my husband didn't want me to tell anyone, but I told Father Ben anyway in this note. And um, the next day, our daughter hit her head. Our youngest had hit her head. She had a mild concussion. And all these people were praying for us. And she didn't need to be hospitalized. We were all Valentine's Day. We we're just watching her. It was a Saturday. And we we're just watching her. It was in uh, 2015, trying to make sure she doesn't hit her head again. And then um, that night, we all slept soundly. And in the morning, we um, we slept in. We're late again for our Anglican church, and it's a big parish meeting, so we can't be late, and we have to be there, and we can't go to the Catholic church for mass. So we, um, so and my husband's just like everybody needs to get in the car, and we get out there because we're still new to Idaho. We forgot all about the snow and the ice, and then we're scraping. So now we're 15 minutes late. And the kids are like, let's just go to Mass. I, we don't want to go to this church anymore. Let's just go to Mass. And my husband in the car, he said, we are not becoming Catholic. I'm like, you just said we would discern during Lent. I mean, in my head, I, I would, <laughs> wouldn't be disrespectful. But, you know, and, and he said, we are not becoming Catholic. We are just not becoming Catholic. And, and we, we, we haven't given this Anglican church enough of a chance. We keep going to Mass. We haven't been to our church in a month, month of Sundays, literally. And so we're going to give this Anglican church a real chance. You know, we're done with this Catholic church. And the kids were just stunned. And I was stunned. And I was like, Lord, I don't know what to do. And I'm just praying the whole way. Oh, Lord Jesus, please help. I don't know what to do. And I'm asking the saints to pray. I mean, like, I'm praying a lot in the car on the way there. And so we show up and it's all sullen in the car. And every, all the kids come out and I I start getting the, the toddler out of her car seat, and all of a sudden this man comes from the church building, and he says, there's no room. And my husband stops, and he looks at him, and the man says, there's no room. And my husband looks at him like he's staring him through, and he says, no, there's standing room. You can come in and, and stand, but there's, there's no more seating. All the seating's gone because of this parish meeting. And my husband... His, uh, he just looks at him, and he's just stone still, and the and this color just rises up to his face like a thermometer about to pop, and he he's like, and he just says, looks at this man, just looks at him through, and he just and then he looks at the kids, he said, everybody, back in the car, <laughs> and so we all get back in the car, and we all get our seatbelts on, and then and he starts the car, and he has his hands on the wheel, and he said, Emily. Where are we going to Mass? <laughs> and I said, well, St. John starts at 11.30 and St. Mark's starts at 11. And he said, we're going to St. Mark's. <laughs> and he starts to take off. I made him make him stop. I said, you can't drive right now. And so we, we um, switched around. And as he's getting out of the car, he's like kicking the snow in the gutter. <laughs> and he's getting in. And, um, and the whole way, he said, God wants me to be Catholic. I can't believe he wants me to be Catholic. <laughs> I asked the Lord for a sign, and he gave me a sign. The Lord wants me to be Catholic. And he said, I can't believe it. And he said, the Anglican church doesn't know how to run a church. You know who knows how to run a church? The Catholic church. They're the only ones who know how to run a church. <laughs> he was just fit to be tied the whole way there. And then he, he calmed down once we got into the parking lot. And he said, now, Emily, I don't want you to tell anyone. I know, I know we were meant to be Catholic. I know. 
I need a moment to calm down and we need to have a good conversation. I was like, yes, I understand. So then we, um, we did, we talked really, we talked about it some more. And he said, he, it just, it was that, was that last thing. You just capitulated. It's the one true church. And he knew it. He knew it, but he was just something within him was fighting against it. And just that one moment, that was the last straw. And, um, so we, uh, I talked to the, um, the pastoral associate. She had us write letters, all of us write letters. And um, then we met with Father Ben, who um, made sure we understood the sacraments and understood mm-hmm. things well enough. And then he brought all of us into the church on August 9th, 2015. So it was the feast of St. Edith Stein, St. Benedict of oh, the wow. Cross on a Sunday. Neat yeah. one. Neat one. Often when people go through this journey, and of course we in the Coming Home Network are always dealing with people at all different stages of this journey towards the church. And, and as I heard your story, you know, it's interesting to see different fingerprints of the Holy Spirit that were in your life that we've seen in others. But you get to that point, like I'm thinking your husband, where all the questions are answered. But what hasn't happened yet is that mandate. Mm-hmm. You know, it's I can sit here and I can answer every question about the church and I can say she's 100% a Christian church and all this stuff. But there's that mandate mm. about I've got to become a part of that. It's yes. kind of that last mm-hmm. thing. And sometimes that takes a real two by four from God to awaken somebody. <laughs> and that's, that's right. what your husband got. That's that's right. the... <laughs> and he loves it. I mean, he loves the church. <laughs> and he's great. He's great about, you know, we, we go to mass together as a family. And we're, you know, he's we're involved with a, a small faith community in our parish. And he's he's wonderful. He is. But it just... It took, it took a two by four. Yes, sir. <laughs> we got a couple emails here. Let's see if we can sl- slip them in here. This one comes from Donna from Atlanta. She writes, I'm interested in the Catholic faith, and I think I've sorted out most of my issues relating to Mary, but I feel like I'm stuck on the Immaculate Conception. I think I'm at the point where I'm willing to trust the church on it, but I also want to understand it. Do you have any thoughts on how to wrap my head around this dogma? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh, I think for me, it was just realizing how essential Mary is in our salvation history and who she is and that the church fathers believed that somehow she was sinless. You know, it didn't become dogma until the 19th century. And um, I wish I could explain it, this mystery better, except I just... She is so necessary because Christ is so necessary. And in, and yes, and I've had people talk to me, you know, really to talk about it as a necessity, is that fair? Because it's this act of gratuitous love, right? Her immaculate yeah. conception and what Christ has done for us. But she's just, you can't, the, you cannot fully know Christ until you know Mary. The Mariology yeah. is so essential to Christology and our soteriology. Yeah. It just, it all fits together. And when you take Mary out, you're really losing a large part of Christianity, I believe. And you're short-selling yourself. And that Immaculate Conception, think of Jesus as a Time Lord. I remember somebody telling me this, that you, when you realize who He is, the Word of God, the eternal Word of God, and, and what He does is outside of time, and that grace that is given to us. Yeah. I mean that you're you're. This is a mystery doctrine yes. to talk about yeah, here. It so is, we're so. going to point you to the catechism to get the more detail. But I, I I like the way you approach it. It it's about Jesus. I mean it really is about Jesus and about yeah. Our Lady being being um, asked by God. I mean there's the there's the mystery yes. of her fiat. Oh, yes. But still that 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 again we have the both end of God's predestining and all of that, but also Mary's freedom to respond. So so we have her whole life, God preparing her from the very beginning, yet preserving her freedom. That's why we're stuck with the mystery here. And the church recognizes, but it's really about her being the Ark of the Covenant to receive our Lord, so that her womb was such to receive our Lord. There's that big mystery. Yes. I think we're going to put the rest of that aside. I encourage you to go to the catechism because we've got another email we want to jump into. All right. Okay. Christine from Cleveland. My husband and I met at Bible college, and Christ has always been at the center of our marriage. 
Lately, though, I've been feeling more and more drawn to Catholicism, but he has less than zero interest in it. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about how I might be able to deal with this situation in a way that both honors the spouse God gave me and honors what I feel is God's call towards the Catholic Church? Now, that connects yeah. with that, that, mm -hmm. that statement that your friend made that your husband isn't God. And I was thinking that we need to clarify something there. From your evangelical backgrounds, they didn't believe that husbands were gods oh, either. No, yeah, no, 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 no. They didn't, no. But they yeah. were making a clarification there, even in the headship issue. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, people can take the scriptures from Ephesians and, and push it too far. Right. You know, that, but that's not where you were coming from, no. but, but also clarifying that. So what about right. in, the, in this, in this situation? Oh, you've got to follow Jesus. I think that's my yeah. biggest lesson is you really need to follow what the Lord is doing and to trust him. Um, I write about the saints for the Idaho Catholic Register. And I need to tell you over and over again, that do not fear, a lot of that do not fear is to trust him and following him every day, including, um, doing the uncomfortable and the scary. Um, it's not so much doing the, you know, jumping off a cliff, do not fear, but it's that just that every day that can make you uncomfortable. And um, pray, the Lord answers prayer for sure, and pray for his heart to be softened and his eyes to be opened. But in, as I've also seen in the saints, sometimes that doesn't happen and just have to... Big part of yeah. your story was the faithful witness of Catholics. That's true, yes. So even yeah. in terms of a spouse trying to work with a husband or wife that isn't interested, uh, certainly apologetics can help. Yes. But it's really more about living your faith out. In, yes, in that relationship, yes. And relationship with others, friendship with others, yeah. yes. We got, let's, let's, let's squeeze one more email in. It, okay. Uh, uh, Alina from mm -hmm. San Antonio. C.S. Lewis has been <laughs> my favorite Christian thinker in so many ways for as long as I can remember. I can hardly imagine how Catholic writers could add any depth to the things I've read of his, especially in books oh. like Abolition of Man or Surprised mm -hmm. by Joy. What was it that you <clears throat> were finding in Catholicism that you felt went deeper than Lewis was going in his reflections on Christianity as an Anglican? Oh my goodness, it's that fullness of truth really it's like lewis had so much but it goes far deeper than than that okay. and it, it just the i'm going to go to to chesterton who was a hero of lewis right gk chesterton i was just thinking about this he wrote orthodoxy and so many protestants love orthodoxy because he wrote it when he was an anglican but chesterton became catholic and it was because he saw the fullness of truth in the Catholic Church. So yeah, he wrote Orthodoxy when he was an Anglican, but he became Catholic because that's where the fullness of truth was. That's where it really is because the church really is the church. It's not just spiritual and that's important. And that's something that Lewis did not have. He did not believe that the church was beyond something more concrete than just a spiritual universal um, relationship united in Christ. That church is important. And fact, it makes a difference. There's a, I can't think of the title of the book, and I probably shouldn't mention it on TV if I can't think of the title, but the author is Peter Kraft. Mm. He came out within the last year or so a book in which it's an imaginary dialogue between Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and Billy Graham. Oh, I haven't seen it. It's an excellent oh. book, and it, it, it's as if he is... Imagining the three of them having this dialogue about theology. So cool. It's a really cool book. And the reason I mention that is it gets to this email question a bit. Because yeah. you have in the book, Kreft does a wonderful job of imagining how Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and Billy Graham would discuss theological issues. And it that brings so out the clarity. Cool. So I highly recommend that book. If you do a Google search or whatever on Peter Kreft's books, um, and it might even be the EWTN Religious Catalog. So it's a, it's a wonderful book, so I encourage that. 
Emily, what a pleasure oh, to have you on the program. You so thank, thank you for you. sharing your witness and our prayers thank with you. you and your husband and your and your childrens. And thank you. uh, it's just a great to have you here as a witness. Thank you so much. And I want to remind the audience again, if you go to chnetwork.org, you could find Emily's story <laughs> from High Church to the True Church. More of the details are put together. So thank you thank again for you. joining us. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that Emily's witness is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you again next week.